One of the biggest obstacles to concentration is the hindrance of uncertainty. This can manifest itself in several ways. One is you're not sure if you're doing it right. Another is when you're not sure that you can do it. And another is you're not sure that it's worth doing it all. When you're bothered by these kinds of uncertainty, it's hard for the mind to settle down. The Buddha talked about different ways of dealing with this hindrance of uncertainty. And the primary one is that you look carefully at your mind. And ask yourself, what am I doing and what effect is it having? You're not going to overcome uncertainty by looking at other people. Sometimes we hear about other people who can get their minds to settle down really quickly. And you look at your mind and it's not settling down quickly. And so you wonder, am I doing something wrong? Can I do this? You know, it's important to remember that other people's minds are other people's minds. And one, you don't really know if they are settling down the way they say they are, and two, if they are, what does that have to do with you? Your mind works differently from theirs, and there's no reason to be jealous of other people whose minds settle down quickly. I saw many cases in Thailand of people who would come and see a John Fu, and within a day or two they were getting their minds into strong concentration, and mine was not getting into strong concentration after weeks. And I was jealous. But in some cases I noticed that people whose minds could settle down quickly didn't know what to do with them when they had settled down. There was one very sad case of a school teacher who, after she retired, went to practice meditation at Wadasokaram, and she developed really strong powers of concentration, and she was really quick at getting her mind into concentration. And she developed various psychic abilities. And then she decided to make money off of them by setting herself up as a, as a fortune teller, an astrologer. She'd look at star charts, but what she was actually doing was looking in her concentration. And the problem was that after a while, her concentration started sending her wrong messages. And she got stranger and stranger, believing whatever was coming up in her mind. So it's not the case that people who have strong concentration or are very quick at getting into concentration are to be envied. And John Fuang said that people who find concentration easy have often have troubles with discernment, just as people who are intelligent and tend to be inquisitive have trouble getting their minds into concentration. Or as he put it, Two kinds of people in the world. There are two kinds of people in the world, those who don't think enough and those who think too much. So the way that you're going to get your mind into concentration, if you're the type who thinks too much, is going to be very different from the way that someone who's very quick at concentration will go into concentration. The advantage of being slow is that when you finally do get the mind into concentration, you've been through all the obstacles. You recognize them and you know your way around them. Whereas people for whom concentration comes naturally, when they run up against obstacles, are at a loss. So that's the first lesson. When you're comparing yourself to other people, basically don't compare yourself. Their concentration is theirs, yours is yours. And you're not going to get into concentration by thinking about their concentration. You've got to get in looking at your own mind. And you're not going to overcome uncertainty by comparing yourself with other people either. This has to do with whether you're uncertain about whether you're doing it right, whether you feel like you're capable of doing it, or even the question of whether this is a good path or not. You're not going to overcome uncertainty by looking at other people who are following the path or other people who have abandoned the path. You have to have the willingness to look into your own mind. 
What are you doing right now? What are the results? That's the only way you can overcome uncertainty. The Buddha calls this quality analysis of qualities. When you're willing to look at your mind in terms of cause and effect, and get very precise about what you're doing. And give the meditation some time, because not all the results are going to come right away. Sometimes it takes a while for the mind to be willing to settle down. It's the kind of mind that holds back. And even when the breath is comfortable, it holds back from the breath. It's like dealing with wild, feral cats. They hold back. Even when you're really nice to them, they don't really trust you. Or you may have a feral mind, in which case you have to be patient. There has to be some spot in the body where there's, sense, there's a sense of comfort. If there were no spot in the body at all, you'd be dead or you'd be dying. So look for the area that is comfortable and see what you're going to do to maintain it by the way you breathe. Give it some time. And have some confidence in yourself. Remember, we're not here competing with other people. And the main question, is this comfortable? Do you feel good doing this? Is one that only you can answer. It's not like there's a correct answer out there someplace that you have to guess. The answer is, do you feel comfortable settling down with the breath as it is? And give it a try. And if the mind can stay, okay, fine. If it doesn't stay, you can ask yourself, what can I do to adjust it? What would feel better? And if it doesn't seem that anywhere you breathe is going to be comfortable, just tell yourself, okay, I'm just going to let the breath happen on its own. I'm not going to help it. Let it start when it wants to start. I'll step back and just watch. And see if things can come into a balance that way. In other words, this is your breath. There should at some point be a way of getting comfortable with it, because it is the force of your life. It should feel good coming in. If you're not sure, hold your breath for a bit. And then when you can't stand it any longer, breathe. It should feel good. And say, well, if that felt good, then another breath just like that should feel good. Or maybe something similar to that. And this way you rearrange the conversation in the mind. Because all too often the problem with uncertainty is you've got some really negative voices inside. And you've learned to trust them. And now they're getting negative about the concentration, negative about the path. So you have to turn around and ask them, are you really skillful? They'll insist that they are. But if they're getting in the way of your sense of well-being here in the present moment, there's something wrong. So look around and try to figure out the voices, bearing out the voices that are encouraging. Let's say there is a way to put an end to suffering. There is a way to find happiness. It is possible to breathe comfortably in the present moment, because those are the voices that are on your side. Remember John Lee's analogy, saying that if, if there may be lots of different consciousnesses in your body, there's your, there's your consciousness and there's the consciousness of the different animals and worms and whatnot living in your body, and then there's the consciousness of whatever spirits may be around. And the question is, how do you recognize your voice in the midst of all of that? 
And you have to say, well, it's the voice that has your well-being in mind, the voice that really wants happiness and is confident that it can be done. Find that voice. Latch on to it. That is a skillful voice. And as for the other voices, you have to treat them as distractions, particularly the type that you have to allow to have them chatter away, but you're not going to get involved in their chatter. You step back from them. And you see, these are voices that may have been helpful for some things in the past, but they're certainly not helpful right now. It's in this way that you apply analysis of qualities to the problem of uncertainty. So listen to the right voices inside. And look at the, if you're going to look at examples from outside, think look at the examples of people who have practiced and said that this really works. Do I think of what voices were they listening to? It's not that they didn't have doubts along their practice, but they learned how to see that the doubts were not worth following. You look at the Dharma teachings of the Ajans, and a huge percentage of them are pep talks, saying, yes, you can do this. The Buddha taught human beings, you're a human being. The Buddha taught people who have five aggregates, you've got five aggregates. The, people, <clears throat> the Buddha taught people who are tired of suffering. You have to ask yourself, have you had enough? And listen for the voice that says, yes, I've had enough. I want to find a way out. Okay, that's the voice you hold on to. <clears throat> 